much for that uh, kind introduction. Um, I am going to share my screen. Um, I hope you can all see. So yes. it's a real pleasure to be speaking to this audience this morning. Um, I moved from the University of Cambridge um, last year to the National University of Singapore. And I did so because I'm very excited about the uh, prospects for biomedical research in my field here in Singapore and specifically at the NUS School of Medicine. And I hope in the next 30 to 45 minutes, I can persuade you that in my areas of interest, there are fantastic opportunities for PhD studies here at NUS. So what I'm going to be talking about today is um, how can we accelerate the discovery of next generation medicines for human disease? Uh, this of course includes my own area of interest, um, cancer. So I am sure that all of you in the audience will accept some of the um, uh, axioms that I have set forward in this slide. Um, I think we can see visibly even in the lay press on a day-to-day -day basis, how biomedical research across the world has over the last two decades entirely transformed our understanding of the molecular basis of many human diseases. The problem that we all face, however, is this so-called revolution in understanding has not yet manifest itself with commensurate expansion of the discovery of new medicines. Our capacity to discover new medicines for human disease still lags behind the transformation in our understanding. So I think it's a very topical, important, and challenging area of research in thinking about how new emerging technologies might accelerate drug discovery for the benefit of mankind, again, globally. And I'd like to allude specifically to what I see as the opportunities for graduate studies in this particular area. Um, so let me start by saying a few things by way of background, which I suspect that every one of you in the audience is familiar with. So please bear with me. Um, I think you will appreciate that what makes us as individual humans, what we are is encoded in the information in our genomes in the form of deoxyribonucleic acid or DNA. And there's been a revolution in our ability to sequence the roughly 3 billion base pairs of DNA that are in each and every one of the cells that make up our body. And our capacity to understand the sequence of DNA in different individuals, in different species, has in turn led us to understand better how the molecules that are encoded by DNA, the so-called proteins, work in different cell types, in different organs of our body, to make each and every one of us be individuals with the strengths and weaknesses that individuals possess what we are. As you may be aware, DNA is a code essentially that consists of four letters, G, A, T, C, used in myriad ways in long stretches of this biological macromolecule to package and transmit the information that makes cells behave normally or abnormally from generation to generation, from cell division to cell division. And this DNA in turn is packaged inside the nuclei of cells into structures that are called chromosomes, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, these X-shaped structures in humans. Now, this is a picture from my own laboratory, which shows you the beautiful and wondrous process by which DNA packaged in these chromosomes marked in blue is copied and then segregated as cells divide between the two daughter cells in perfect copies, copied in an error-free way to enable the transmission of genetic information from generation to generation. And equally, we know that errors, flaws, weaknesses in this genetic code 
make individuals more susceptible to disease. And indeed, in some cases, cancer, for instance, it is alterations or mutations in the DNA code that actually engender the disease itself. So the revolution in genomics has, over the last two decades, driven what I call a new taxonomy of disease. And let me explain exactly what I mean by taxonomy. I suspect many of you are familiar with the work of Linnaeus, who hundreds of years ago began to classify life on Earth into species, genera, kingdoms, and so on. And through this taxonomy, the structural classification of different species, we came to a new understanding, a revolutionary understanding of evolution and how life occurs and evolves in families. Similarly, through understanding in great detail the human genome and its alterations associated with different human disease, we have had the opportunity to drive a new taxonomy of different human diseases. In other words, to classify and structure them differently. And what's driven this revolution is really the dramatic fall in the cost of DNA sequencing. And you can see here on this graph that runs until last year, that the cost of sequencing human genomes, each of which contains three times 10 to the nine DNA letters has been falling. And you can also see, despite all the hype about Moore's law in the realm of semiconductors and the construction of chips, you can see that progress in DNA sequencing has actually outpaced our ability to create even transistor chips. So this is very exciting because the era of the so-called $100 genome, when we can actually sequence the DNA in every individual for a relatively low cost is here. So in turn, the ability of genomics to structure, to classify human disease in a new taxonomy has opened what we call opportunities for personalized medicine. What is personalized medicine? Well, it's based on these, uh, on the following premise. And that is that we can now develop a more accurate molecular taxonomy or classification of diseases like cancer. And through this very specific classification driven by genomics, we can in turn enable the diagnosis and treatment of disease in a way that is tailored to the individual characteristics of each patient who, as I said, will vary in their genomes. And this in turn enables us to precisely match the right therapy with the right patient using so-called biomarkers that identify these patients. And this is really the promise of the era of personalized medicine brought about by disease genomics. So that's the premise, but what will it actually take for us to go from premise to delivery to impact in the clinic? As I said, the first step, which is formulation of this taxonomy is already well underway, but there is a lot of work to do still, particularly in complex diseases like cancer, my own area of interest. We need to be able to discover and validate markers that can stratify different patients dependent on this taxonomy. There's no point in actually articulating or formulating this new structure and classification unless you have markers that enable you to classify disease. So we need these markers. And again, progress in this area has been very rapid. But it's the last issue that I want to talk about today you realize that if we envision disease as individual, different in every patient, so every patient who has breast cancer or prostate cancer, each patient will have a different disease with a different classification. So you realize that if you want to really individualize or personalize medicine, 
you actually need a lot more drugs in order to be able to deliver personalized therapy for different forms of the disease. So creation of an enhanced repertoire of drugs and clinical interventions that are suited to individual patients is the next frontier, which I want to talk about today. And I'm going to use as an example, my own area of interest, which is cancer. And I believe we are now arriving at what I call the end of the beginning in cancer research, again, driven largely by the revolution in genomics. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you see the very unique attribute of cancer as a disease. As cancer progresses from changes in normal tissue, which are barely detectable, all the way through to frank carcinoma, which is very easy to see the difference with normal. This pathological progression is actually accompanied by a huge increase in genomic alterations in cancer cells. So in 2005, we were able to read in a crude, not high resolution way, the first genome of a cancer cell and now, 15 years later, which is not very much time at all in, in uh, uh, science research, we have thousands of cancer genomes available, and we are able now to begin to translate this information, as I said, to clinical application, because this genomics has enabled us to uh, drive a new taxonomy of cancer as a disease. And the effects of this revolution are visible in this summary, which comes from the so-called TCGA project, the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, which was conducted under the aegis of the National Institutes of Health in the United States, but had international contributions from all across the world, in which over 10,300 cancer genomes for 33 different tissues were analyzed. And the striking feature is this, that in these thousands of different cancers from multiple different cancer tissue types, only about 300 different genetic alterations in different combinations collude to drive the most common cancers that affect us. And what's even more exciting is that it's clear that more than half of these cancers are potentially actionable in the clinic if only, if only we could create next generation medicines that could target these genetic alterations. So I hope you can see that in cancer, as an example, we really are reaching the end of the beginning of understanding of disease and the time is ripe now to translate this understanding to next generation medicines. So I'm going to use as an example work from my own lab, which um, was kindly alluded to in the introduction. Over 20 years ago, after the cloning of the first cancer susceptibility genes, the breast cancer genes, BRCA1 and BRCA2, my laboratory then in Cambridge was fortunate enough working with our colleagues and collaborators to discover the role of the BRCA2 gene in maintaining the stability of genomic information encoded in chromosomes, which is illustrated for you here. And you can see that in cancer cells lacking the breast cancer gene, BRCA2, normal chromosomes are shattered, broken, twisted into abnormal shapes. And so the genetic information that they encode is also distorted, leading to the mutations that cause cancer. In the subsequent two decades work in my laboratory, as well as in many laboratories around the world, has elucidated at atomic level resolution how the BRCA2 gene actually works to preserve genome instability. 
And I'm illustrating this with some of our recent cryo-electron microscopy work in which we have been able to elucidate the structure of segments of BRCA2 binding to their target proteins around the single strand of DNA in order to help to repair broken DNA or damaged DNA. Similarly, we've been able to elucidate using methods such as super resolution microscopy in cells, how BRCA2 is able to guide the assembly of these structures that you can see at atomic resolution in the cryo-electron microscope. So you can see that in two decades, this field has moved a long way from the discovery of this function in preserving genome instability to understanding it in molecular detail. And I'm very pleased to say that we have been able to go from taxonomy to mechanism to treatment and work from many different laboratories across the world, illustrated for you here, have shown that cancers that lack BRCA2 respond really well to certain DNA damaging agents, drugs that damage DNA. And we also now have developed so-called stratification markers. This is a so-called genomic biomarker, the HR detect assay developed in order to be able to classify patients based on the genomic sequence of their cancers into those that harbor BRCA2 mutations and will respond precisely to this class of drugs. So this can work. We can move from taxonomy to mechanism to treatment. So why isn't this happening more frequently in many different human diseases? Well, the problem is that perhaps we were lucky with BRCA2 because translating disease taxonomy to mechanism generally remains very challenging. So as you know, biological and biochemical pathways inside human cells are extremely complicated and work through the interaction of multiple different macromolecules, usually proteins, organized in very complex, nonlinear, redundant ways. The genetic and biochemical alterations that cause disease perturb these pathways, make them abnormal. And the actors in these pathways, proteins usually, which are affected by disease-associated uh, alterations, they often have multiple structural domains, they work in different functions, they work in multiple different pathways. So major challenges, even if you can classify and understand the mechanism of a disease associated genetic and biochemical alteration, what is the right target? How do you find it within this myriad of different interactions that make up complex biological networks? How do you find the right molecular targets for new drugs? Still a big challenge. And it doesn't stop there. Even when you know the mechanism, even when you have structural information concerning the target, we face a whole series of other challenges. The human proteome is thought to encode between 50,000 to 100,000 different proteins encoded in about 25,000 genes, which can be spliced differently, encoding proteins which can be modified in different ways. So there are more proteins than there are genes that encode them, if you will. And out of these 100,000 or so different proteins, less than 10% of them have been successfully drugged by industry and academia, despite decades of effort. To make things even more complicated, as I said before, proteins and other macromolecules can also interact with each other. 
even if you count binary interactions, one-to-one -one interactions between proteins, there are over 300,000, nearly half a million of these binary interactions. And almost none of them, perhaps five or so, have actually been drugged because they are just not accessible to existing methods for drug discovery. So the next big challenge is how do we create new ligands, new drugs that can target previously inaccessible molecules once we find them and validate them as good targets for the development of next generation medicines. So what? So there are many challenges that we face, can we afford to take it easy? I would argue certainly not. In my opinion, the status quo is simply not an option. The cost of bringing new medicines to market is estimated by pharma to exceed 1 billion US dollars, can take 10 to 12 years at the moment, and yet the failure rate is 70 to 90%. Can you conceive of any other industry where such a high level of cost over such a long period of time with such a high failure rate can be tolerated? Yet it is in the pharma industry. As the COVID-19 outbreak has taught us, we can't stand still because new diseases, infections, new types of cancer, they're emerging all the time. And if we want to treat people with personalized approaches, we need more and more medicines. So the global unmet need is acute. And so we must face up to these challenges and overcome them, not in the next 20 years, but hopefully in the next five. And this is the area in which my own laboratory has been working for the last 10 to 12 years. How can we devise new technologies that confront and surmount some of these challenges to accelerate the discovery of next generation medicines? And what I'd like to share with you today are some vignettes, some very simple, uh, I dare say oversimplified vignettes that concern three major areas that we have been working in, which address each of the challenges that I have articulated. First, how can we interrogate, scan complex nonlinear cellular pathways that are altered in disease to identify rate limiting steps and thereby pull out the right targets? We've developed new genetic tools that enable this, and I'll share some of our work in this area. Second, once you discover targets, many of them are probably undrugged, may even be thought of as undruggable. So how can you combine structure determination with computational methods, with chemistry and biology to discover so-called lead compounds as starting points to accelerate new drug discovery. And finally, if there's time, I will briefly discuss some of the work that I did in Cambridge with my colleague, Alessandro Esposito, to develop new types of light microscopy that can interrogate living cells very rapidly in real time to reveal how new drugs actually work inside cells. And this suite of different new technologies actually serves to address many of the challenges that uh, I alluded to in the last few minutes. And what I'd like to say is our work has not been confined to academia. We've been fortunate in that as we have discovered in my laboratory, new tools, new technologies, and made new discoveries for starting points for new drugs, we have been able to take this work to industry. As an example, we've been able to spin out this new genetic technology, which we call protein interference, into a company foremost, which has been very rapidly successful in partnering with major pharmaceutical companies across the world 
to discover new targets, new druggable targets for diseases in cancer, of aging, of metabolism, and in many other therapeutic areas. So let me start by trying to tell you a little bit about our work on protein interference, this new genetic technology that, as I said, has been spun out into foremost. So just to recap some of the issues that I said before, traditional drug discovery has not paid much attention to the identification and careful validation of targets. Instead, pharma companies have focused on making new drugs and then spending a lot of time in clinical trials trying to find out if these drugs work. The problem is this is difficult, takes a long time, and is very, very expensive. So there's a very poor return on investment. So we thought in my lab, perhaps what we should do is to alter this balance and develop new technologies that can improve the identification and validation of targets so that hopefully we could move to rapid focused clinical trials, which are shorter and allow a higher return on the investment into drug discovery. And there was an example that set us thinking this way, I would say an exception rather than the rule, where work on melanoma, a skin cancer, had shown that one particular protein, BRAF, is often mutated, and Plexicon was able to make a very selective drug targeting mutant BRAF, and they were very able to take, quickly able to take it to the clinic. And here you can see the dramatic effects on a patient with melanoma. The skin lesions have all faded, and this drug is, has been very successful, at least in the first treatment of patients with malignant melanoma. And the challenge, as I said, is where do we look for new targets? Classical druggable targets, about 500 kinases, perhaps about 500 to 700 protein receptors like G-protein coupled receptors have all been drugged already. These are the classic druggable targets. Pharma has been working on them for the last 15, 20 years. Most of them have already been drugged. Many molecules on the surface of drugs, which are accessible to antibodies, are also pretty well covered by companies. So really, the next frontier is these macromolecular interactions. There are potentially millions of macromolecular interactions, untapped, currently inaccessible. So we set our minds to developing a new technology that could identify rapidly rate-limiting and druggable macromolecular interaction targets for next generation medicines. And this is protein interference, which is the new technology that we developed in my Cambridge lab. And essentially what we have done is to take advantage of protein structure evolution and develop libraries that encode millions of biologically diverse, naturally occurring shapes, if you will. How did we do this? We harnessed evolution and we reasoned that primitive species, archaea, eubacteria, were rich in different protein shapes, naturally occurring protein shapes, far more diverse than the protein shapes that are found in human cells. So we harvested these types of shapes from many different primitive species and built large libraries and introduced them into human cells. And we found that these shapes shown here in purple could bind to specific sites on human proteins and inhibit or modulate the function of these proteins. And that in turn would lead to different phenotypes. For example, we could look for probes like this that would induce the death of cancer cells or the secretion of insulin by diabetic pancreatic beta cells. And the beauty of this technology is that using the probe, we can now pull out the target protein and also directly identify the site that we have to drug 
So very quickly be able to move from validation and identification of the target through to the creation of a new lead compound. And indeed, this is the technology that was spun out to foremost, and I believe has already demonstrated its success in partnership with multiple pharmaceutical collaborators from major pharma companies. For those of you who are interested, some of our first work was published just this year, um, and this is the reference uh, to the work uh, exemplifying protein interference as a new technology. We've also been pursuing other approaches to expand the druggable proteome. And here's another example that I'd like to share with you. So as you know, many drugs target enzymes like protein kinases. And enzymes, by and large, work by hydrolyzing the fuel molecule, the energy molecule, ATP. And typically, ATP binds, as you can see in green here, to a very deep and well-conserved pocket that the drug binds to better than ATP, so it excludes ATP from that pocket and inhibits the enzyme target. But what we have been doing is a different approach because often ATP competitive inhibitors are very similar to one another because ATP is the same and the structures that engage it are often very similar and therefore you can have cross reactivity of target effects and other problems in making such drugs. So what we have been doing is to explore what we call allo inhibitors that can inhibit enzymes not by targeting the ATP site, but instead by targeting the macro molecular interactions that are unique to every enzyme and regulate its activity. And some examples are shown for you here about how this type of allosteric regulation can actually work. For lack of time, let me simply say that we worked with many colleagues and collaborators, primarily, I'm sad to say, um, the late, um, my friend and colleague, Chris Abel, um, died last year, in untimely death, but he, Tom Blundell, were really instrumental in developing some of these methods, which use sequential structure determination using X-ray crystallography to identify small chemicals that bind to active sites within proteins and use chemistry to then elaborate in a structure guided way, these small fragments into large specific potent drugs. So in my lab, we have used many of these technologies and suffice it for lack of time to say that we have been successful in devising some exciting new structure guided platforms to discover so-called allo inhibitors for targets that were previously considered undruggable. And again, for those of you who are interested, I would refer you to the series of articles that we have published in Cell Chemical Biology, where we have targeted the protein-protein interactions of many different enzymes, the polo-like kinases to target KRAS mutant cancers, the human BRCA1 tandem BRCT domains to induce genome damage in cancers, and inhibitors of the RAD51 ATPase that can potentially kill cancer cells by inducing DNA damage. All of these examples will illuminate for those of you who are interested our work in developing these exciting new structure guided platforms that can discover drug like ligands for targets that were previously considered undruggable. How do we understand how these new drugs might work? And how can we identify stratification markers that tell us which patients should receive these new drugs and also tell us whether the drugs are working or not? So the challenge here has been the complexity of cellular pathways. 
if you perturb one element, often like throwing a pebble into a still pond, the ripples spread everywhere and you don't know where they come from. So working with Alessandro, we've developed a new kind of light microscopy, which we call hyperdimensional imaging microscopy. And for lack of time, suffice it for me to say that using these new microscopes, we can simultaneously acquire spectral information from samples, as well as information concerning fluorescence lifetime, as well as information con concerning the rotational anisotropy of uh, fluorescence emitting molecules within the sample. And those of you in physics will realize that spectral properties, fluorescence lifetime, and rotational anisotropy comprise all of the three dimensions of photophysics that every photon contains passing through the sample. So we can now deconvolute complex signals from living cells. And this unmixing enables us to undertake multiplexed readout of drug perturbed cellular biochemistry and thereby discover or scan for stratification markers and readouts for drug activity within cells. And again, for those of you who are interested, some of the principles of hyperdimensional imaging microscopy were published just a couple of years ago from my lab. So I hope in that brief whistle stop tour, I have persuaded you that there is a lot of space for developing innovative new technologies that can extend the reach of drug discovery by tackling, by confronting and surmounting major bottlenecks in the process. And I think we still have many challenges left and the challenges I group in my mind into these three questions. First, as I said before, how do you find targets? In other words, what do you drug? Second, having identified a target, how do you create new chemical ligands? In other words, how do you drug? And finally, how do you match new drugs to patients? In other words, who do you drug? And I'd, what I'd like to share with you is not work from my own lab, but work that is rapidly emerging in laboratories across the world, which I think gives you a sense of the excitement and the multidisciplinarity of the approaches that are being developed. The first vignette I'd like to share with you is the rapidly rising impact of computational methods, particularly so-called deep learning or artificial intelligence methods. As I said, there are many challenges from where do you drug to how do you drug, which are amenable to new technologies based on AI. Perhaps the most startling example is work from DeepMind, which is a small, relatively small startup company now taken over by Google. It was started in London. And DeepMind basically found a computational solution using AI to a 50-year-old problem, which is if you have a primary protein sequence, just a stretch of amino acids, how do you predict the structure of the folded protein encoded by that protein sequence. Because obviously there are millions of different possibilities. How do you find the right 3D structure? And suffice it for me to say that DeepMind developed really exciting new ways of casting this problem and solving it using the methods of artificial intelligence. And their program, AlphaFold, is now being used to predict protein structure, helping to solve the problem, the challenge of where do you drug and how do you drug by being able to predict the structure of targets once they're identified without having to do X-ray crystallography, cryo-electron microscopy or other such methods. 
I'm in no doubt that as the amount of data from clinical trials, from patient uh, uh, associated disease phenotypes increases, AI will also find a lot of application in answering the challenge of who to drug, besides where to drug and how to drug. So watch this space. Second, I'd like to highlight new technologies which are emerging in which so-called chimeric ligands, protax or protein targeting chimeras can bind to target proteins and not inhibit them, but induce their degradation. And this is an exciting new development. And what is illustrated here is how such a chimeric protact molecule works. It's a chimera because it has two parts. One, it has a ligand, which basically binds to the target. And second, it has a degradation sequence or degron that channels the bound ligand for degradation by so-called ubiquitin proteolysis machinery in which ubiquitin ligases, which are bound to this chimeric ligand, become ubiquitinated and then targeted for degradation in the cellular proteasome. So this is an entirely new way of making drugs. Rather than inhibiting the target, we use chemicals linked to in chimeric molecules to degrons to be able to degrade the target, remove it completely from cells, an exciting new approach. And last but not least, not just chemicals, not just proteins, but also nucleic acids are being used as new therapeutics. These nucleic acids can act as vaccines. A very famous example is the Pfizer BioNTech and Moderna RNA-based vaccines against COVID-19. And you can see how rapidly they could be developed and how effective they are. This is the next generation, nucleic acid-based vaccines. Many other nucleic acid therapeutic modalities are under development that can modulate, inhibit, or even deplete cellular targets. So again, a very exciting new emerging technology that will, I believe, transform therapeutics discovery in the near future. So I'm going to stop there with the scientific aspects of my talk and spend the last few minutes that I have sharing with you some thoughts regarding a PhD and specifically a PhD here at NUS. But I hope before I pass on to this part of my talk that I have persuaded you, if you're interested, this is an area, regardless of your background, if you can contribute, that you should really be aiming to get into. It's a very exciting emerging new area for the future. So what are my thoughts? about studying for a PhD, what a PhD is all about, and what, you sh what should you be aspiring to do during your PhD. I think my guiding principle for all of the PhD trainees in my lab is that I want to train scientists, not technicians. In other words, I'm not interested in merely teaching people how to do things. But in trying to impart the know-how about how to choose a scientific problem, how to design incisive, definitive, elegant experiments that can address hypotheses, and how to interpret the data in a critical and rigorous way. In other words, I feel that supervisors should guide intellectual development and not simply teach you techniques. Techniques will come and techniques will go, as I hope my science talk illustrated. What you need are portable skills in being able to think about problems, in being able to communicate your results, in being able to write and speak effectively, all aspects of intellectual development which are at the heart of your PhD. 
I trained in clinical medicine before I did my PhD. And fortunately, clinical medicine is a very broad based discipline, which involves skills all the way from people skills, all the way through to scientific skills. But I would emphasize that nowadays, the areas of scientific progress are increasingly occurring at interdisciplinary boundaries. So if there's any piece of advice that I can give you all as you embark on your PhDs, find as far as you're able interdisciplinary programs. And I hope some of the illustrations of work in my lab have conveyed to you how the integration of mathematics, biology, structural biology, cellular biology, chemistry can actually lead to breakthrough developments tackling important scientific problems. Interdisciplinary research really is the present and future imperative. Why should you come to the NUS YLL School of Medicine to do a PhD in this area? Here are some of my thoughts. As you've heard already from the provost and from the graduate team, the faculty here really are world-class. That's one of the reasons that I moved from Cambridge here because of the exciting horizons and the potential to undertake cutting edge research from the bench to the bedside on real world problems. There's plenty of opportunity for interdisciplinarity. And in Singapore and globally, there's a lot of scope for post PhD careers, not only in academia, but also in industry, ranging from biotech. I've illustrated some of the startups that have come from my own laboratory, all the way through to major companies, including major global pharma. They're all looking for well-trained people in these areas. In my own sphere of interest, there are two graduate programs that I draw your attention to. They all have booths, posters, and even videos in the, uh, in, in the open e-open house. These are the NUS Center for Cancer Research, the N2CR PhD program. I lead the NUS Center for Cancer Research and it brings together basic science and clinical faculty, over a hundred faculty members into a single collaborative program that offers plenty of bench to bedside opportunities in the area of therapeutics discovery and research. And in my own institution, the Cancer Science Institute, the CSI PhD program also offers a combination of a didactic curriculum, which aims to add value to your learning and bring everybody, whatever your background, to the same base in the first year before embarking on rotations that expose you to many different labs of your interest before you choose a PhD lab and a PhD topic and supervisor for your later studies. So I'd encourage you to visit the CSI and the N2CR booths to find out more about PhD programs there. So with that said, let me end my talk and I'd be very happy to take any questions from the audience. Thank you, Professor Ashok, um, for a very inspiring talk. Um, as some of you may know, cancer is one of the leading cause of death in Singapore and also one of the leading cause of death in the world. So this very meaningful research because you're going to save a lot of lives. Um, so um, 